In this video, we're going to talk about the normal distribution, which is going to be the first of the continuous probability distributions that we're going to talk about in this class. It is definitely the one that I think is the most important. It pops up all the time. Uh, there are a couple others we're going to talk about, and they are certainly important in their own ways, but this is the one that ends up being used in a lot of different scenarios, as well as one that's kind of very similar to this, but a little bit more accurate. So the idea is, if you went out and you measured the weight of a bunch of adult males, and then you broke them up into classes, and you were to write out a histogram, the shape you're gonna get is gonna look something like this. It's the, the bell shape that we've seen before. This is what we call the normal distribution. Now there is an actual mathematical equation for this thing. And I'm not gonna give you the, the full details, but it's something like e to the negative x squared. So it's some crazy formula that you don't need to know. You will never ever use this actual equation for this normal distribution. You just need to understand the shape and what certain properties it has. So let me draw a little nicer graph of this and try to talk about some details about the normal distribution. So in our normal distribution, it looks something like this. There's always going to be a center, this high point, and this is going to be at the mean. So the highest point on the graph, which is what we would call, say, the mode, is at the mean. And it's the population mean here. We call that mu. So whatever the population mean is for adult male weight, it would be right in that center of our graph here. Now, if you look at this graph, if you look to the left of the center, to the right of the center, they look pretty similar. It's kind of almost mirror images to the two sides. And if I was a better artist, it would be exactly a mirror image of the two sides because if you look at this graph, it is symmetric on the two sides here. So that's the second property. It is symmetric about the mean. That means when you're looking at uh, the shape on the left side of the average, it's going to be the same exact thing as the shape on the right side of the average. Now keep in mind, I want to point out something here that we are talking about now the theoretical normal distribution. If you actually took data of you know, uh, the weight of adult men, and you graph that actual data, it's not going to be perfectly symmetric because you're never going to get the data that's going to make it work out perfectly. So we are kind of going from the beginning of, you know, this is where the normal should come from, from certain data. When you graph it, it looks like this. And now we're extending that to saying, well, okay, mathematically, if we try to look at the theory behind it and where this comes from, in that case, we have this perfect graph and it is going to be symmetric. Okay. Um, the book will also say that there are these things called inflection points. Um, basically, if you were to go to the right by one standard deviation, new plus sigma, and you go to the left one standard deviation, that's where the graph's going to have this, this curving point that's changing it from where it's kind of, you know, like a, a parabola or a graph where it's going downwards to where it's kind of flattening out here. I wouldn't worry too much about these inflection points here. But the next point I will write down is that the total area under the graph is going to be one. So if you were to find this whole area in this whole shape, that whole area is one. And that's gonna represent probability. So that one is the same as 100%. So that goes back to the basic probability idea that the probability that something is gonna happen 
has to be 100% in order for things to work out. If you add up all the probabilities, you get 100%. So in this case here, we're saying the probability that you're going to get some weight when you measure the individual, well, it's 100%. They're going to have some weight number. It might be around the average. It might be higher than the average. It might be lower than the average, but it's going to be somewhere here. And in fact, because it's symmetric, the left and right are the same, the area to the left of the mean is 0.5 or 50%. So if you were to draw the graph here, you've got your middle point here, mu. If you look at just one side of it, that area is 50%. And so that means that 50% of the data points are going to be below the mean and 50% are going to be above the mean. And that means that the mean and the median are actually equal for these graphs. Because the median is the part where, you know, half is less and half is more. And the center of the graph is at the mean. And so those two have to be equal. So we get our answer here. Now, what we're going to need to be doing now is if we're going to want to find some sort of probability, we're going to need to find areas in different parts. Like, for example, let's say I had a normal distribution with a mean of 10, and I wanted to find what's the probability that you are something 15 or more. So the way we're going to answer probability questions at this point in time is we're going to be trying to find these areas in order to do that. And I will show you how to find those areas, but I just want to tell you right now that you are not going to be able to find those areas by doing a geometry formula. All right? You, maybe you can find the area of a rectangle, length times width. Great. Maybe you can find the area of a circle, pi r squared. But these are not that nice a shape. In fact, it's essentially impossible to find these areas on your own. These are weird shapes and they require advanced techniques. And really what they require is a computer doing calculations over and over again in order to try to get the answer. And there's two main ways that we can choose to actually find these areas. The way that was used for a very, very long time was people did the, the long, tedious calculations. They got an answer. And then what they did was they calculated the answer for a whole bunch of different scenarios, basically all the scenarios you might want to use. And they got together all that data and they put it into a table. And so literally what you would do is you would see what area you're trying to find for a probability. You'd get over, pull out your table. You'd look at this gigantic table and see what the value is. And now you have your area. And I will have a video that shows you how to look at those tables. With that said, however, it's no longer necessary to use the tables for something like this. And that is because the calculators have advanced to the point where they can just find the area for you. So I will also have a video that shows you how to put it in your calculator and get the area that way. So we're going to learn in a future video how to find all these areas that we want to. In this video, I want to just emphasize the reason why we're finding areas is because the area is going to tell you probabilities. So if I just go ahead and erase area and say probability, they are going to mean the same thing for these. So when I ask you to find the probability, it really means you're finding the area, but they're the same thing here. Now we are gonna be able to learn how to find the areas for whatever numbers you wanna have, but we have the empirical rule from before and that will tell us some areas, some special ones. And I'll go ahead and show you those three situations. And let me draw this a little better. So we have our mean here. If you were to go left and right, one standard deviation, so you're gonna go up to mu plus sigma and down to mu minus sigma, then the area here, if you remember before, that's 
Now it's not exactly, maybe I should put an approximation there, but it's a pretty good approximation. Then if you were to go further on your graph, if instead of stopping at one sigma to the right, if you were to go two standard deviations to the right and two standard deviations to the left, then this area here is about 0.95. And finally, if you go out to three standard deviations really far out to the right and you go to the left three standard deviations really far to the left then what area you're going to get here is like 99.7 percent so whenever you're dealing with a normal distribution if you happen to be trying to find the area when you're either going up or down one two or three standard deviations you can use the empirical rule, you don't have to do the extra hassle, and you get your answer. However, what if you're going one and a half standard deviations? Or what if you're going to 2.78 standard deviations? In that case, the empirical rule is going to fail us, and that's what we're going to have a later video to show you how to find those areas. Um, for now, though, I do want to point out one more thing, is that because it's symmetric, if we know that from one down standard deviation to one up standard deviation is 68, then if you just take one half of that, you get 0.34. And you can do the same thing for either one of the other scenarios as well, just take half of the area and that's what you're gonna get on either side. So occasionally, instead of going up and down one standard deviation, you just wanna say, what happens when I go up one standard deviation? In which case you can break it down in that fashion.